the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegan, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heika when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heika? Thus, the village of Centerville became Heika. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish, but when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Haika. Two miles west of Haika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heika and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Rover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heika, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. It was a very pleasant day today. It was in the 40s. And um, we were going to um, do a phone call. We were going to have a telecommunication with R Richard Wiegand because he was a founder of the um, Lutzi House Barn or the Centerville Settlement. But for some reason, we didn't connect up right, uh, we, and we can't get a hold of Richard right now. Perhaps he'll call in later on. We do have a few rules. Number one, raise your hand when uh, you want to uh, speak, because that way Jerry can get, uh, have time to get over to you, and also use full names. Um, and I want to welcome Janet. It's very nice that you did this on short notice. I hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoy having you. So, and um, this evening we're going to talk about our favorite Thanksgiving experience or an, uh, Thanksgiving experience we had. Well, I'm going to talk about one that my mother had. My mother came from a family of 10, and one Thanksgiving, one couple got late and they ate everything up, and all that was left on the platter was the bones of the goose. <laughs> that was before my time. But that family was real. They played jokes, and they were real, real jolly, and they had a good sense of humor. I must have gotten the Leffler sense of humor. <laughs> so, okay, and your identification, please. My name is Kathy Sixel. Okay, thank you. And I'll pan over to this gentleman. You can identify nice and loud and identify yourself. I'm Willard Mathias. And you want to know what? what yeah, if you had a favorite Thanksgiving back in the past or lately? Well, I remember one Thanksgiving when my brother from Sheboygan wanted to come out for Thanksgiving dinner. And he got as far as Locust Tavern, Logan's Tavern. That's okay, on, Osmond Logan. there. Yeah. Uh, no, this is at uh, on Bird Mimi. Now? Locust. Lo Logan, huh? What the Locust. 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 Okay, Tavern. Okay. And it was so much snow that he couldn't get through. This was about 1947, 48. So my dad and my brother Elroy got the milk truck out and they drove over there <laughs> and they picked him up and left his car sit and he had to stay overnight by us. And that was our Thanksgiving. That was the Thanksgiving. Most exciting Thanksgiving we had. We, had, <laughs> we were always waiting for them to get there and everything was done, ready to go. And he was in, they had to wait for him to get home. Okay, <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. And who are you here, please? I'm Alice Mathias. Uh, only thing I sort of remember, we always had family Thanksgivings and our, we had eight kids and mom and pop. And then as the older ones got married, the families got too big, and all of a sudden there weren't so many at Thanksgiving dinner anymore yeah. because they were in their own neighborhood like or sure. their own thing. Yeah. Other than that, that was it. Okay, very <laughs> good. Thank you. And who do you have here, please? Irene Dine. And I don't know, just one Thanksgiving the same as Willie said. Uh, we were going to go out with Matthias to at Manitowoc to eat. And it was so much snow, we ended up staying home at your house. You remember that? Oh, I don't remember. Yes. <laughs> what did we eat? Whatever you had. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Very good. And who do you have here, please? Um, Fred Jacoby. And uh, what I remember about Thanksgiving is our family, okay. the Hilbert Zilla family, and the Robert Lutzi family used to have all these holidays together. And the feasts were unbelievable. Everybody raised their own ducks and geese. And... Um, and uh, I'll tell you, it was something else. <laughs> I, no, I would say, with that group. <laughs> the three families together. Estimate-wise, what do you think the count of the bodies were on that day? Well, Zills had three, four kids, depending on who you crowd Richard. And Lutzi's kids were mostly grown up then, okay. already. Evelyn was just married the night when I remember, to okay. Bruce, Melvin Bruce. Yeah. But uh, we had four kids, and Zills had four kids. Tip, we, we tipped over the table ready to eat. We oh tipped, my gosh. We, the table was set. We tipped over the dining room table at our house one time. But I don't remember if it was Thanksgiving. It was one of those holidays. Okay. 
Very good. Thank you. And who lives here, please? I'm Walter Chris. And all I can remember is that we had our family together for Thanksgiving. Okay. I didn't buy anything real special. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you. And who lives here, please? I'm Kathy Wagner. And I can't remember any one fantastic Thanksgiving. It's, I just know that since I've been married, I've had Thanksgiving. I have cooked Thanksgiving dinner for 50 plus years. Really? <laughs> wow, you're a steady one. Yes. <laughs> Very good. They can they can count on you. <laughs> right, right. But they, this year they're all bringing something. Oh, <laughs> finally. 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 Oh, they did last year already. Actually. Good for you. And who do you have here, please? I'm Dolores Crass. Well, I don't know. This is a common dinner. We had chick We usually had chicken. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanksgiving. Sure. Very good. Very good. After we were all grown up, I came from a family of eight. So oh, okay. Oh, boy. Then uh, we took turns. Good. That helps, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And who do you here, please? Marie Pippert. And I don't remember anything special either, but we took turns, too, and it was always turkey, turkey, turkey. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which I'm not too fond of. You're not too fond. What is your favorite bird? Oh... Uh, Pigeons. Pigeons. <laughs> Pigeons, the chicken, <laughs> pheasant. Okay, very good, Marie, thank you. <laughs> and who do you hear, please? Charlie Maurer. And I think the, the Thanksgivings I remember the most would be those when my grandfather was still alive, because we always always went down there as a family. Okay. We Where's that at? Down on the Silver Creek Road, down on the original oh. farm set. Okay. Those good memories good, there, huh? Good memories there, yeah. Good, good. And who do you hear, please? Dorothy Anderson. And uh, I don't remember anything specific, uh, except I don't. We never had turkey at home. We always had goose. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much, Dorothy. You're welcome. Young lady here would uh, like to identify yourself, please. Go right ahead. Uh, my name is Edith Woodsy, and well, we had four kids, but from my family, there was five in the family, and we always would get together with all of the sisters and brothers too. Okay. But then we would kind of rotate. Sometimes we'd have Thanksgiving, sometimes we'd have Christmas. That okay. would change off. We didn't have it every year then. Sure. Well, that was the way to do it. It takes and a little we, pressure off. And we always had uh, whatever. It was usually ducks because that's what we raised at the farm. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. And who do you have here, please? Janet, let's see. Her daughter. Okay. <laughs> so she said it. <laughs> I should tell about one of the memorable Christmases Mother and I had. Um, she came down to Milwaukee to visit me, and she always wants to go to a church in her in her faith. So we went to Wisconsin Synod Lutheran Church on Thanksgiving, okay. and they were having free meals. Oh. It also was a meal site for the needy. So we were in the basement with all kinds of people, with people in fur coats and pearls and people who lived in boarding houses or on the street. Yeah. And it was just one of the most interesting, pleasant, um, thankful Thanksgivings I've experienced. Wow, well, very unique, very good, thank you. And myself, uh, Jerry O'Neill, the videographer. Uh, the only uh, Thanksgiving I remember quite well, we had it at what they call Wanniger's uh, eating place uh, in our area. And uh, the waitresses that they hired for the onslaught of people uh, weren't quite adapt to carrying big trays. And uh, the young lady came over my mother's head, sort of like, and she tipped the tray and all the juice ran all over my mother. <laughs> so she was kind of sopping wet from all the grease. <laughs> okay, we're here again at LTC. And I don't know if we have a subject matter, but Kathy can lead us into something. Go right ahead, please. I want to ask everybody, talking about food, wasn't it like Thanksgiving and Christmas that food tasted so good compared to today? Why do you think that was? We didn't have to make it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was why. Or do you think it was because you didn't have that kind of food so often? Like today we have food. Yes. Every kind of food that you, that you can think of year round, and so. Right. Uh, Frederick. The, the poultry was, was yep. Himself. Please. Here, who has some recollection? Go right ahead. Oh, I got recollections. Uh, Frederick Jacoby, but I'm thinking the poultry was raised on a farm. It wasn't force fed. It didn't have to be ready for the market in eight or twelve weeks. Okay. And I just think it was totally different, um, different meat you had in the first place. Okay. 
And of course, the old cooks didn't do that much wrong, you know. It was good eating. Yeah. Who said something that tasted good? Well, it did. Yeah. It can still taste good, but it... There's a difference. There's a difference, I'm sure. Thank you. Young lady, I'd like to say a few words. Go right ahead, I'm please. I'm Alice Mathias, and I was going to say, in those days, nobody used anything packaged. Ah. And that made a, good, a big, big difference in food. The quality of the taste right, and everything. Right, Ah, you're right. Okay. And then I think just the, uh, what do you call it, the family get-together was good. Sure. You know, it made the food taste better, too. Yeah, you were always with your cousins and your uncles and aunts and so on. No, no, we were just we with our brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> that was always good. Because we didn't have, um, we didn't have a so big So that's all. Going. That's it. Thank lady who'd like to give us some directives, go right ahead, please. Uh, my name is Kathy Sixel, and this evening Janet Lutze is going to be presenting um, the history of the Lutze House Barn, or uh, or with it, what should we call it, the Centerville Settlement. Okay. Okay, okay. and she will tell about the beginnings so and so forth. Okay, thank you. Young, young lady here, and she'd uh, like to say a few words and introduce herself one more time, please. Janet Lutze. I am the daughter of Roland and Edith Lutze, and I am the fifth generation of Lutzes to live in the south town of Centerville in Wis Manitowoc County in Wisconsin. My great-great-grandparents came to Wisconsin in 1849. And the first year they stayed in what we believed to have been an immigrant inn, which was actually the neighbor's house. And that first year they cleared the land and made timbers for building a building, which we call the house barn. I remember growing up with this building that we just basically used for storage. And of course, if my dad was alive, he was gonna, was gonna tear it down. But it was such a big old well-constructed building, it would have cost too much money to tear down. So as a result, we started Centerville Settlement and now we're preserving the building. Um, Gottlieb and Frederica Lutze came from Saxon, Germany, in the southeast corner of Germany. And they came with four children one of them was an infant, and the trip took about two months. It was usually about a month, sometimes two months, on the ocean, and then another month to travel by rail and boat to Wisconsin. They had originally intended to go to, to Milwaukee, which is where most of the immigrants went. And they went to Milwaukee, and they would find out what lands was available. But at the time, uh, Centerville, spelled C-E-N-T-R-E-W-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, was a shipping port. And it, it was a major fueling spot for a lot of the ships traveling up and down Lake Michigan. So the ship that the Lutzes were on stopped at Centerville, and it had been a horrendous trip. And the young child, when they were on the ship, had been sick. I mean, you can imagine spending one and a half, two months on a ship without very good food and rough seas and this little child was sick and the captain had just insisted that that child was sick and needed to be thrown overboard because he was going to infect the rest of the crew. So Frederica hid the child the rest of the journey and of course she grew up to be a well developed married woman. But they landed then in Haika or what later became Haika and they heard Saxon German being spoken. And being the good, strong German lady, Frederica said, we are staying here. I'm not going to go anywhere else. <laughs> and at the time, the Yenigs across the street were Saxon German, and they had come the year before. So they bought 80 acres of land and proceeded to clear the land and start laying out the building, the house barn. Um, the house barn is a structure that's very typical of many, many European countries. And we have, since we've started this project, we actually found blueprints in a book from German timber framing. And it's the Lutzi house barn just flipped. The north is the south and the east is the west. We think it probably took them more than a year. It was, the, wood, the timbers were all cut in the woods, hand-shaped. Um, if there was any mill work done, it was hard for us to see differences in mill, in um, sawmill type of work. And the east end of the building is the house, and the west end of the building is the barn. Now, on this picture uh, in the 1950s, 
And this big building here is the, the house barn. The last person to live in it was um, my great-grandmother, and she was in, lived in it in to 1896, at the same year that the yellow brick house was built. And she was going to stay in the house barn. She did not want to move into the yellow brick house. I think she thought there was going to be already too many strong German women in the house. <laughs> but then it started getting cold, and she moved into the yellow brick house. <laughs> so that's the last time that anyone had lived in the building. Of course, three years ago, we had a sleepover for the first time that anyone has slept in the building since 1896. And several of the people here tonight actually were in on the sleepover. Um, the house barn is on the National Registry of Historic Buildings. It was placed there in 1984. I'm going to let my mom tell you the story of how that project started. About salvaging the house barn. Uh, we were getting rid of some... Uh, this, I'm Edith Lutzian. Uh, we, we were starting to get rid of some stuff from the house barn. And we had a rummage sale. And then there were some visitors from Chicago there that went through it, and they said, oh, you can get all kinds of money to restore this, but you know, we haven't found any yet. <laughs> 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 because this is worthwhile restoring. <laughs> and that's the way, it, the way it really started, that we even thought about it. When they said how remarkable this building was, and we just thought it was the, just old house. The old house, we always only called it the old house. Yes, the old house, the old house. Um, yeah, and I, I grew up in it. You know, we kids from school or our cousins would come over and we would take them around the building and show them that, you know, this was the house part and this was the barn part. But you know, you don't really think about it until the rummage sale. And it's like, oh, yeah, I guess they're right. <laughs> so I started making a couple of phone calls and I must have made the right phone calls because within a couple of months, Alan Pape and Bill Tischler and, a, and some grad students from UWM came out, spent a couple of weekends at the farm, lived in our camper on the farm, and did all of the research, all of the documentation necessary for the National Registry and submitted it to the National Registry. I was still trying to figure out how to do this, and they had already taken care of it. So in 84, it was placed onto the National Registry of Historic Buildings as a nationally significant building. Um, it could have gone in as local or state or national, and it was of national significance. In fact, it went in at the same time as the Pabst Mansion in Milwaukee, which was local, local significance. And the people on the board who heard the presentation and the nomination were far more excited about the Litzy Harps Barn. It is, to our knowledge at this point, it is the only remaining structure of its architectural design left in America. In about 18, er, 1990, 1986, somebody from the National Parks, um, United States National Parks um, Division, came out and visited with it, Alan Pape, and at that time, he had only known of two others besides <laughs> ours. And one of them was already falling down, and we've never been able to trace the, the second one. So as far as we know, it's the only building of its kind. It's huge. It's like 34 feet in one direction. Charlie probably knows the dimensions better than I do. And um, 92 total, east and west. And there was an addition added on, and we think in about the 1880s, as they gained more livestock, they added an addition, which was probably for horses. Because my grandfather and August Litzy, my great-grandfather, really got into horses. They bought an additional 100 acres of land in, I think, the 1880s, making it a grand total of 180. And they needed all of the horses for, that was the largest farm in the section at the time. Um, so, so the building's on the National Registry, and it's like, how, we can't preserve this. You know, we don't know how to even begin to do this. There's never any money available for anything like that unless you have a nonprofit organization. And as we started talking about it, Richard Wiegand joined us, 
Kathy Sixel joined us, Dorothy Anderson joined us, Alan Pape was in on it, and as we started talking, it became evident that this building was really a representative of what the entire township was about. At the time we started our project, South Union Road from Oker Point Creek to just past the Saxon Homestead, that two, three mile stretch, had nine family farms in the same buildings on the same land into the fifth and sixth generation. I believe there's only one or two left in this time. Centerville Township was a very strongly Saxon German settlement. And it's a unique township because there are so many farmers on the same land, especially at the time we started, still farming, still using the same buildings. We may now find the same families on the same farms, but they're not farming. They're, they've sold the land or they've rented out the land. But it's a, it's a very unique community. And the house barn really represents that whole immigration process of the Saxon Germans to Centerville Township. So those of us who got together, our founding members, we formed a nonprofit corporation. We wrote up our bylaws. And I did the 501c3 papers, which is the nonprofit corporation. I mean, that was another thing. I was trying to research how to do that. And it's like, well, you know, if somebody doesn't do it soon, it's going to be too late. So I started the process and sent it off, made bunches of phone calls over the next year to some lady in Chicago, and we got her 501c3 papers. Usually, nowadays, it costs five to $10,000 to have a lawyer do it. <laughs> so we were pretty lucky. <laughs> May I interrupt a moment? Uh, you mentioned some names that are sort of founding patrons of this. Uh, could we get those people on tape as identification? Yes. Okay, just one moment. Uh, we have been designated that uh, Kathy was a member and she'd like to indicate when she joined and so forth. I think that uh, it was in 1984 and I think we met at the Wiegand home, at Richard's home, right? Janet yes. uh, contacted us and there was, uh, I think, five of us, correct? Five and or there was one time at the cabin, at your cottage. Oh, okay, yeah, that could be too. That I have, don't even recall. But it was 1984 when okay. I uh, was affiliated with it. Okay, thank you. Like to identify yourself and indicate when she was part of the group. Uh, Dorothy Anderson. I became part of the group when it was formed, and I guess it was 84. And um, we met at the farmhouse and uh, uh, planned it. But then we didn't do so much about the house barn. We were just an organization, okay. Centerville Settlement. All right, very good. Uh -huh. Well, thank you very much. Young lady, you would like to identify yourself and indicate a few well, things? Edith Litzy, and I think I said most of it before already, but I, we stayed with it. And many times we didn't know just where we were going to get because there weren't that many people. The Cleveland area does not want to save anything. They want to build new, I think. Oh, really? We could not get the village of Cleveland interested at all. No kidding. <laughs> Turning around. Okay. <laughs> but well, but well, we are hoping that it's just going to turn around now and they, they see how valuable these things are. Sure, sure. People, I, I think years back, history didn't really mean that much, no? but now no. people are seeing what happens when you destroy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Young lady who would like to identify herself and pass on some more information. Go right ahead, please. Janet, let's see. Um, another founding member was Richard Wiegand, and he's also a fifth generation German in the area, and he was very very um, instrumental in helping us with all of the project. He's still our um, vice president today. Okay. And my brother and sister-in-law, Sarah and Richard Lutze, are also some of the founding members. Um, at the time the organization started, Mom still owned the farm and all the buildings. Okay. And then when she sold the buildings to my brother and some of the land, it was a stipulation that when Centerville Settlement was ready to accept it, that the house barn and six acres of land would come to Centerville Settlement. So the actual donation of the building and six acres, 6.34 acres of land, uh, were donated by Sarah and Richard. Okay. And that was about 12 years ago. Okay. So from the time that we founded the organization until we actually accepted the donation of the house barn, 
The real focus of the organization is the preservation of the rural farming heritage, the architectural and cultural heritage in the Centerville area. Centerville is a, also a very strongly zoned farming community. So one of the goals of the organization is to preserve that heritage, whether it's the culture of the people, the cooking, the architecture, the, um, the flavor of the entire area, and support farming. We had one of the first things that we did was we had um, a workshop that was designed to assist farmers in finding some alternative businesses to help support the farming process. And if we could take a break here, sure. ma'am. Young lady who would like to uh, pass on some more information. Right ahead, please. Hi, Janet Lissy again. Um, this is a partial map of Manitowoc County, and I wanted to point out where Centerville Township is. Uh, actually, this is the entire township, right, Charlie? This is Centerville Township. Okay. And the gray areas is Cleveland proper. Now, the Lutze House Barn is on South Union Road, which is this road that runs north and south. By the way, just a bit of history on South Union Road. Um, it runs all the way from Sheboygan County line into Kohler, actually, and through Manitowoc County to the north line of Manitowoc County. And it was an alternate route for the Union Army from the Green Bay Road because oh. in highly traveled times, the Green Bay Road was so muddy and over-traveled that they needed an alternate route for the heavy equipment that the armies needed to use to go to the Civil War. I see. Very good. So anyway, uh, South Union Road, this is the old highway, and the, the house barn is right here. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Now what? What else? Well, I Where thought of I? something else. When yes. she was saying, for the, uh, I am Edith Lutze, and I, when she was saying about how it started with Alan Pape coming, many times that they came on a weekend and then they asked, well, they didn't want to drive all the way back to Sheboygan or to Manitoba if they could stay overnight. <laughs> but, <laughs> they got acquainted with the place. <laughs> else, yeah. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> well, some more information that uh, would like to be presented. Go right ahead, please. Janet, let's see. Um, I wanted to tell you uh, when I had said the people who did the National Registry papers was Alan Pape and Bill Tischler and some grad students from UWM. Bill Tischler is professor of the School of Architecture and Urban Development in Madison. And he has been a long, long, long time uh, friend of historic preservation. Alan Pape also is an architect by profession and he also is a long time friend of historic preservation. He has led lots of movements in the state for preserving different things. And some of you might have remembered um, uh, the worst house that he, or the Bratwurst Museum that Alan had wanted to talk about. He's done some work in Sheboygan. He helped with restoring that bicycle trail um, from Sheboygan to wherever west. He's done a lot of things. He's written books on, on uh, log cabin construction and preservation. Well, but it's instrumental in old world was That's just what I was going to say. Alan and Bill Tischler and another man and Jim Schaefer all had the idea for starting Old World Wisconsin. And Alan Pape's job was to find the old buildings throughout Wisconsin to be brought to Old World Wisconsin. Um, Alan Pape is on our advisory board. Jim Schaefer is on our advisory board, and Bill Tisler continues to be on our mailing list and is always asking questions. Anytime I see him, he's just always trailing, finding out what we're doing. Um, back to the goals of the organization, preserving the culture and the architectural things. Uh, some of the things that we've tried to do in terms of the culture is we've had um, bake oven Sunday, the, the Saxon Homestead has a bake oven, and we had them bake bread for us, and we all joined that. We've done some old-fashioned movie evenings. Um, we've we've um, toured some of the historic sites. We've had one or two of our special events at the Sessler's Mimi House. We got actually to see the upstairs of the Mimi House. Um, we've had open houses at the at the house barn and invited the public to it. 
The, the Litzy House Barn, by the way, is an international affair. We have had visitors from around the world. We have members uh, from around the United States and actually um, someone from Lebanon as well. And so it's an international affair. It is one of the only sites that we know of that is open to anybody who wants to stop in during the actual restoration process. Most places are closed during the restoring of a building. And it's not just the restoration of the building. It is also the preservation of the skills that went into making the building. So those people who come out learn to mix mortar and lay stone and use old-fashioned tools and help shape mortons and tendons and put on siding and we do some artifact documentation. Um, there's lots and lots of things that happens at the house barn that's just related to history, not necessarily the building. It's a preservation of a lot of the skills. We do have internships in the summer in timber framing and this next summer, anybody who's interested, in June we're going to do a Wednesday through Saturday workshop on nogging and we're going to do another workshop in August, a Wednesday to Saturday nogging. If you don't know what nogging is, I'll have some pictures I'll show you. I have a whole stack of pictures. I think we can probably go through those okay. now. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, questions and uh, opinions came from the floor, and uh, she'll straighten these out. Go right ahead, please. <laughs> Um, I wanted to clarify that Old World Wisconsin is in Eagle, Wisconsin, and it's a living museum site of the different nationality buildings that have been brought to the site from throughout different parts of Wisconsin. And also, uh, some of the things, we've, we've actually had a fair amount of publicity. We've been in, uh, obviously, a lot of our local papers, but we've had been in some national magazines. And one of our, our funnest things that many people have probably seen is Wisconsin Public Television came out and spent three days with us and did, we were included in a production of Wisconsin Barnes, Stories in Wood and Stone. Okay. So that was a lot of fun. Mom often gets comments about her movie star status. <laughs> <laughs> I want to throw in a, a question uh, and only, it's a curiosity thing from my side. Uh, in Old World Wisconsin, they moved the buildings to that site. Yes. Uh, is this uh, in contemplated in plans with the house barn or not? No, no. If you move any building, you lose its national registry status, partly because the building is part of where it belongs. Okay. And especially the Litzy house barn. It was the first building built when these immigrants came over. And typical of many farms, and you can see them in this area as you drive around, but many, many other farms in the country, they built the original structure, and then they add buildings around a courtyard. So at the Litzy farm, the, the house barn was the first building. Then they built a sheep barn next to it. Then they built a part of the barn, which was 1884. Then they built another part of the barn. Then they built the yellow brick house. Then they had another building that was the pig barn and slaughterhouse. And then you had all of these buildings forming a big courtyard. It would be very similar to Europe where buildings were built around the courtyard. Of course, their courtyards were much smaller okay. than the courtyards in the United States. All right, very good, very good, thank you. Um, I want to show you a couple of this picture. This particular poster was put together for our um, preservation people. They often refer to the pictures. Uh, the pictures show the house barn in the background so we get a sense of what it was through time. The first picture that Charlie's focusing on is, um, oh, we probably think it was about 1820, and the man in the doorway is August Lutzi, and he's feeding chickens, and if you look really closely, there's a cat and a couple of pigs in there as well. <laughs> August Lutzi was, uh, had an artificial leg, and it's kind of hard to see in that picture, but again, if you look closely, that one leg has his boot, has a real turned up toe, which was the wooden foot with the toe for easier walking. Mom can tell you the story of how August lost his leg. Janet, don't forget the story of how he got lost. That was him, right? When he was out in the woods. Uh, the grandma and the grandpa were going to church and it started to rain. And while well, the children, the, the two boys were driving the team and the 
It started to rain and the grandma put up her umbrella and that spooked the horses. The oh. horses ran away and the grandpa, the father, was going to save the boys and the horses. He jumped off the wagon and got his leg caught in the spoke of the wheel oh. and broke it broke off and they amputated his leg right on our kitchen table without any really my it's, goodness what a story it's the, the kitchen well. table that sarah and richard still use okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and we do have his art his artificial leg the one that was sophisticated with movable joints really? but he also had a peg leg and we have that as well oh for heaven's sake now kathy has a story yeah. from our august as well okay all these my name is Kathy Sixel, and I would like a, a story that I read about August, that when he was a young child, they were making wood, and he wanted to go home, and they said, follow the line fence. But he went the opposite way, and he walked and walked and walked, and he ended up in St. Asians. In one day and night, he walked that long, and when he got there, he got to a log cabin, and he stood on a doghouse, and he looked in the window, and the people saw him. So they took him in, and I think it was on a Saturday or, you know, it was the weekend. And then the next day, they brought it up in church that they had found this boy. He had walked on their yard, and it took a week. And then they got him back to Cleveland. The word got, on, got out, you know, that this boy would have, was lost in St. Asians. My goodness. I can't even uh, fathom a story like that, because when you think walking from here to St. Asians, right, and in the wilderness like years ago. We wouldn't even do it now, right? <laughs> Early. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. Young lady who's going to show us a little bit of uh, blueprint, if you will. Go right ahead, please. This poster is uh, a picture or a, a plan of what the, up, the house barn looks like. This is just the living quarters. So this is the east end of the building. The bottom part of the picture is the lower floor. And as you come in, you come into a, a room that could have been a mud room or a receiving room. Um, it had a little pantry in it that's no longer there. And as you walk straight back, it's the kitchen, and they had the big old wood stove, which was actually in this building, it had central heating. So the big old wood stove had stove pipes that ran to other rooms throughout the, throughout the house, uh, which was unique in that time versus little separate stoves in different parts. And that room the kitchen also had a brick floor for the restoration we've lifted up the brick floor to preserve it and we'll put it all back down as soon as we're done with that and off of the kitchen it's labeled here formal parlor but that's not true this room was a dining room and then a little small doorway from the, the dining room into a large room which would have been the parlor or the living room um, and it's an, actually a large room it was divided off in my time and by my parent, my grandfather, and our hired man parked his car in there. So after 1896, you know, it was just used for storage. At one point, one of the Litzies was a shoemaker, so we have a lot of shoemaking artifacts. Um, the kitchen was turned into a blacksmith shop. Part of the parlor was turned into a woodworking shop and the garage. <laughs> um, there's a story just even with the, the hired man. My grandfather hired a man when he was 14 years old. The man was 14 years old. His name was Robert Schneider. And he stayed working on the farm as the hired man until he was 75 or 76. He was a part of our family. You know, he worked the farm. He was the hired man. He lived with us. He helped babysit us. I just always knew him as part of our family. Hmm, very neat. So back to our little picture. The second floor, as you come up the steps, at the top of the stairs is what I would think would be the mudroom. It's partially finished. The plaster is not on the wall. And I have a whole bunch of other pictures I can show you as we go through this. And off of that mudroom is, again, the big room which is a sitting room or an upstairs parlor. It would have been warmer upstairs. It's big enough to set up a quilting frame. Off that room is the largest bedroom. And then off the mud room is probably one of the really nicely preserved rooms. We have it set up with some artifacts so you can kind of get a sense of what it was. And then two other bedrooms. And then down the hallway is the barn. And the same way downstairs, 
down the hallway is the barn and then the cellar stairs. I'll show you some pictures of all of that. Um, all of the upstairs rooms are absolutely original. All of the woodwork and all of the uh, wall decorations, the plaster and stuff on the wall, that's all original. We have one crack in one wall was as we were stabilizing the building that crack formed. Otherwise, the upstairs is in great shape. The downstairs, because it was used so much for um, blacksmith shop and parking cars and woodworking shop, it has a little bit more damage to it. But still, there's a lot of wonderful uh, characteristics to it that you'll notice. Kathy has a question. Kathy has a question. I'm Kathy Sixel and Janet, would you talk about the stenciling that's on there yeah. and um, the... Um, I was hoping that we have some... The um, woodwork, too, well, how, what it was painted with yeah. to yeah. get its color. Okay, thank you. There are a few things that are uh, going to be on display on the easel, and uh, this young lady will identify herself again, please. Janet Lutzi. Hi, Janet. Um, I have a bunch of posters now I want to show you, but I want to give credit where credit is due. We had a woman last year who spent uh, quite a bit of part of the summer with us from Two Rivers, and she did a presentation to the... Um, Ladies of the Round Table in Manitowoc, I believe was the name of the group. And she made these posters for her presentation and then she donated them to Centerville Settlement. And this is only half of what she did. And what her name was? Do you remember? Um, Gail Ash. Gail Ash. Okay. A-S-C-H-E. All right. Now, this is one of the upstairs bedrooms that we have set up um, to be somewhat reminiscent of what it was. You can see the stovepipe hole where the heating was and also down here. The, the stove pipes would transmit heat into the room and it was radiant heat off the stove pipes. Are you having trouble seeing? No, <laughs> <Yeah>. no <problem>. <laughs> The bed that we have in the room is a co donation from Kathy Sixel and so is some of, yeah, and so is some of the linens on the bed. The crutches were August Litzies. Uh, we've had donations of chairs from assortment of people uh, linens also came from Dorothy or from Kathy, and a nice silk petticoat. The ewer and um, wash bowl, Gilbert Aaron's donated to our or to the organization. I'm going to stop you for a minute. That word, ewer. Yeah. I never heard of that before. Pitcher. That's a pitcher. Yeah. And could you spell that? Could you spell the word ewer? Ewer, e w e r. Okay. Janet, is it because it's a pitcher with the bowl? No, a picture just means you were. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, notice the walls. Those are original walls. Um, the plaster on the walls, I don't think I have a picture of it, but a good plaster job, I could talk to you for years, a good plaster job is actually three layers of plaster. The first layer of plaster goes on a, on, on a set of lathes or slats, and it should be just enough plaster to go through the slats to hang on, not so much that it falls down. Okay. and not so little that it doesn't hang on. Okay. And you can see on one of the walls what a good job the plaster people were. So the first layer is put on, then there's a second layer, which could be a, the last layer. But if you have a little extra money and you want a really nice, fine job, you put on a third layer. And these all walls all have a third layer of plaster, which is a real fine finishing layer. And then the paint itself, the rooms were painted with probably some sort of a whitewashing uh, 1850s paint, uh, tempura probably. I did a little research on some paints not too long ago. But then it has a pattern to it, which is not quite visible in here, but it's a, um, a crushed paper or a rag paint. You dip it in bluing and you just dab it on the walls. So that's the paint throughout the entire building. We did see in the kitchen, though, that there ha were a couple of layers on it there was at least two reddish colored layers underneath the top blue one, and we have not seen that in the other in the other rooms. Let me take the next poster. Okay. Continuing to look at some pictures that, that are being presented. Go right ahead, please. This is the same room, just in a different corner. Um, the child's crib was a donation from Chris Cannell, and it's got a little bit of a rocker to it. And again, some of the linens are from Kathy. The trunk, the immigrant trunk, was a donation from Vern Wernicke, and that is his family's immigrant trunk. We don't have one from our family for some reason or other. 
um, and there's parts that lift out of it. And this top part actually kind of folds down and then can be locked back into place. And when it's closed, it has a round dome on it. And supposedly, the immigrants like to get the trunks with the round dome because you can't stack anything on top of it. So if it was put down into the hold of the ship, it would have to be on the top of the pile so they could get to it during the voyage. Okay, thank you. Okay. Another picture on display, and uh, this lady will describe it. Okay, in this poster, it is the downstairs stairwell. And we, the uh, woodworking, remember I said it's all original? This is the original woodworking. And the, the painting on the, all of the woodwork was in some sort of a, a red tempura. And then they just used um, some sharp instrument, like with five prongs in it, and just made a wavy design okay. down the length of the doors. And all of the frames throughout the building, they have that. You can see in the hallway the half timber construction. Oh, yeah. This wall separates the house from the barn. And it is a fully nogged wall. And by that I mean it's a clay and straw insulation. There isn't any other nogging any place in the living quarters, but the barn is all nogged. <laughs> They were paying much more attention to their animals than they were to the heat for the humans. <laughs> but of course, they had a stove. Okay. okay. A continuation of some additional, I'll call them portraits, they look so well. <laughs> so if you'd like to identify yourself one more time, please. Janet Lutzik. Okay. This is another bedroom. This is the big bedroom upstairs off the, off the family room or parlor. Uh, and on all of this woodwork, where they would have had hooks hung for hanging their clothes. Remember, they didn't have closets. They might have had a big piece of um, furniture that would have stored clothes, but more than likely it would have just been pegs on the wall where they hung their clothes. And some of these nails were, you know, we put them in throughout the course of time. Also in this picture is um, a plow okay. and some wheeled thing for pulling something. <laughs> People have put these two things together, but they really don't belong together. This room, we just have a little bit of artifact storage in it. The wheel thing is a corn cutter and uh, an old nail keg. The, the windows in almost all of the windows are still fully intact. And if you look at the glass, it's this old, old glass. And you know, glass is made from silicone. It's actually a liquid silicone. So over time, it runs. And in some of the rooms, you can just see this waviness in the glass, so you know that it's original glass. Any time that we've had to replace a pane, we have used from some other old building. And again, Gilbert Ahrens was very generous in a lot of the donations that he has given to us. And we have two repair, two of the volunteers that we call, we call them the window boys. <laughs> They're, they love carpentry. And they've been doing all of the restoration on the window sills, uh, replacing all of the frames. These windows, you know how modern day windows are? You would have um, the, the um, caulking on the edges and you might have some little nails holding the frame, the glass into the frame. There's none of that in these windows. That is all wood. So if one little piece of wood wears away, the whole window comes apart because it's just all put together with just pieces of wood fit in place. Well, and the gentleman's in the picture? Oh, yes. The person in the picture is Chris Connell, and he is the project director for the restoration of the Litzy House Barn. Okay. He has, he started it at, with just the love of doing it, but he has really become quite the expert. He just came back from um, a National Timber Framers Guild, and he goes every year. He's been to Germany to the German Timber Framers Guild. For the first time, Germany invited Americans, and I think they had 10 Americans that went to Germany last year that they opened, the guild opened up to other people, and Chris was one of those. And this year, he attended the German here in the United States and a French. And the Japanese was supposed to come, and they weren't able to. The person was sick. So he has become quite the expert on restoration. I should also tell you, in the process of restoring the building, 
it is extremely well researched. Before we do anything, it's very, very well researched. What kind of wood we're going to use for the siding, what kind of paint we're going to use. The paint will be, was taken to Madison for analysis. We've taken seeds to Madison from in between the walls for analysis. The wood itself for the siding, what kind of wood was it? We found out it was a white, spru a white pine that's not even available anymore. It's not grown anymore. It's a different type of white pine. Um, an example of how well researched this is, I love the mortar story. Chris, when he knew we were getting to the point that we wanted to do some work on the North Foundation, he started researching mortar. Mortar is a mixture of lime and sand um, in order to keep the stones held together. It's like cement, but it's a little different. But we wanted to get the right mixture of sand and cement and lime that would last well, that would look the same as an old building, and it would be as close as possible to what they would have used at that time. He spent three years researching that. One of the years was he built little rock piles <laughs> with different types of mortar and then watched it age to see how it would age and if it would have the right color and the right consistency for working with. That's how we got our recipe for developing the, the mortar. So everything is that well researched. Um, there's a timber on the east side of the building that has to be repaired because there's some rot in it. Chris started researching that two years ago and we won't get to it till next year. He's talked to all kinds of timber framers and architects and engineers of how we can support that building and how we can replace just that piece. Oh. Very well, very well researched. Okay, thank you. My additional portraits, I keep calling them, and they are that to me. They're very well done. And you can identify yourself one more time. Janet Litzy. Right, yeah. This is a picture of the fruit cellar. Um, any, any of the immigrant farms would have had a fruit cellar. They almost always had fruit orchards. And in my time, I do remember the fruit orchards with multiple kinds of fruit trees, plums, pears, cherries, blackberries, gooseberries, um, currants. We, everyone had all of that stuff for, for their, their pantries. And everyone had a fruit cellar. This one was, we believe, added after the building was built, which makes it kind of an unusual structure. It is a domed brick structure. And when you see the back wall, which is a stone, that's the very back wall. Right out this door is the stairway going upstairs. It would have had a dirt floor. And in many of the fruit cellars, it would have also been sand in one part of it, where you would bury the, the root vegetables, carrots and turnips and rutabagas, would be buried in the sand for storage. And in my time, we had lots and lots of big round apple barrels. And we had lots of apples that we stored in the basement. And the shelves were filled with big crock pots with pickles and all kinds of other things that we had pickled. Storage of some of the meats would have been pickled in or put into some of the big stone crocks. And tallow or lard placed on top of it to seal it, to preserve it. And this room, this basement room, maintains a 54 degrees year round. So we use it sometimes on our work days for keeping things cool. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, thank you. No question came up and uh, I believe she can answer it. Go right ahead, please. Hanging from the ceiling, you can see our um, some meat hooks. So the meats would have been heavily salted for pres preservation and, and dried and hung in this cool cellar. Okay. Um, during the Prohibition, I heard man Bobby Schneider made bootleg down there, and then the three windows that were in the basement were <laughs> sported up. <laughs> <laughs> Some additional information being presented. Go right ahead, please. And this poster, it is a picture of the, the siding and the feft work. Now, one of the unique things about the, wood, the building is the facht work, F-A-C-H-T-W-E-R-T. I think. <laughs> it means infill. We've had lots of big discussions on what fact work means. It means infill. It could be any kind of infill. It could be, uh, in some cases, bricks, stone, wood. Actually, in one of the walls and in the upstairs, we have shavings. But on all of the barn walls, it's a fill of straw and clay and sand. And these 
upright bars are called staves. You can see the base timber here, or the main timber here, with an angle timber. And in those timbers, there's little notches so that these staves stay in place. Because that's what keeps the clay where it belongs. Now, when we restored the north wall, and by, this, by the way, the north wall is done with the exception of siding, um, we really couldn't redo any of the clay infill in that part of it because you really need to have access from both sides of the wall. But with the south wall, we've had to take out the whole barn section of the south wall and replace most of those timbers. That's what we're going to do next summer in June and August, is learn how to mix this clay mixture so that we have the right proportions of sand and clay and straw and pack it in from both sides so you don't have air pockets. Otherwise, that can cause problems. And in Gutlob and Frederica's time, they would have used rye straw because rye to rodents is kind of like eating um, fiberglass. Really? So hopefully we can get a hold of some rye straw next summer. Um, and then once, once that's packed in, then it's got to dry. And it can only be put in in warm days. Once it goes below, uh, I think Chris told me, 50, then you can't do nogging anymore. Then it's too cold. Then it dries, which is why we're doing June and then August. Dries between there. Then you put on another layer, a smooth layer. You almost paint it on, but it's a thicker layer. And then there's a third layer that's actually painted on, and it's a very thin finishing layer. And if you see the buildings in Europe that have the, the big timbers with the white in between, they may have clay. That may be clay, but then they whitewash over the top. We don't know in the house barn at what point the siding was put on. We don't know. One of the theories was that it was all clay and straw infill to begin with, and maybe even had some whitewash, although we didn't find any evidence on any of the timbers of whitewash. But maybe as the clay washed out, then they went and put on siding. But there's some other indications that it was put on originally. So we, we really don't know. We have a running joke that it's just another one of those Hmm, questions from the house barn, and we have a lot of them. <laughs> we just don't know what their thinking was. Okay, thank you. Another picture that's being presented. Go right ahead, please. This is up in the attic. Now, remember I said the east side is house, and the west side is barn. And it's three floors plus fruit cellar. Um, so you could call the fruit cellar as another floor, but it also has a pigeon coop, which could be an extra half floor. <laughs> Large animals and the stove was on the main floor, generates heat. Second floor then was smaller animals and bedrooms. Third floor was hay and straw storage to act as insulation. So it was a nice, warm, toasty little building. On, one, on, the, on the far west end of the third floor is also a pigeon coop. And I remember my grandmother always raiding the pigeon coop either for for meals or to sell. You know, the pigeons are squab, and people pay lots of money for them. It's another way of bringing in, in money for uh, a struggling farm. But in the attic, all of the timbers are exposed. And if you get way down into the corner at where it meets the rafters, all of these timbers are numbered. building or laying out all of these pieces of wood in the woods, they were putting numbers on them of where they were supposed to go. It was almost like it was a prefab. You know, each timber was numbered, it, and there's a system that runs east to west and south to north. And I just found out this weekend there's actually an official German numbering system that I can get a hold of that is, that is this numbering system. It wasn't like one, two, three. It no. Was. It was more like Roman numerals, but then it had also little extra flags on it. And I think some places in some of these posters, I should have some of the numbers to show you. But in, in the upstairs, you can see them very clearly down at the rafters. And I also wanted to point out, in between these pieces of wood, 
that's cedar shingles. So the original uh, roof on that building was cedar shingles. And they have all the space between, because the cedar shingles will absorb a lot of moisture, and so they don't rot. You have to have air movement in between there. But then probably in the 20s, uh, they put a tin roof on it, a raised seam tin roof. And that's really what saved the building. Otherwise, you know, the roof would have rotted away and then the whole structure would have fallen apart. Another picture that's going to be presented with information. Go right ahead, please. This poster is of the upstairs barn part. And it's kind of a storage area. I mean, we have artifacts stored kind of all over upstairs, you know. We just don't have the room to know where we want to go, go with them. So as restoration happens, we move them to another spot, and, and we move them to another spot. But this is, this is the barn area, and just some things. This is uh, some old chicken coops um, that was donated to us with the little chicken holes and all that kind of stuff. In my time, we had chickens upstairs. Actually, at one point, we had chickens upstairs and downstairs, and then chickens upstairs and pigs downstairs. And <laughs> so it was mostly um, storage and livestock during my time. Okay, and your time would be in age-wise? Uh... <laughs> was that a nasty question? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody needs to know that. <laughs> Actually, I'm Edith's I am Edith's oldest daughter. Okay. And my sister Shirley is two and a half years younger, and then I have a sister Sharon who's fourteen years younger, and my brother Richard is sixteen years younger. Okay. Of course I always tell everybody I'm Richard's younger sister. Oh, okay. <laughs> I almost had Elroy Yaker fooled one time, <laughs> and he was confirmed with me. <laughs> These are just some pictures of the north wall. This is a picture of the north wall that's done. You can see the foundation. That's a totally new foundation. That foundation was the third repair in that building. There's a little bit of a natural water runway that runs right underneath the building. And it had washed out at least twice before that we know of, before we replaced this. And when we started restoration on this building, talk about building being over-engineered. If you can see again back on this poster, okay. you see the two major timbers running across here? Yes. It's as if this whole lower section was one separate section and then the upstairs had a separate section and they just put them together. So when the foundation started to give out and, and just kind of tumble down and, and pull away from the building, this lower section, instead of falling down, it was still hanging on the upper section. So it just hung there. Oh. And it kind of swung back and forth. Mm -hmm. Not quite that easily, but you could put your hand on it and make it move. <laughs> It's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. And we always tell the story of Chris being Mr. Hercules. We had, the summer we started this, we spent one year, by the way, one whole year of just putting in support jacks to make sure that the building wouldn't fall down when we took out the north wall. <laughs> so we had engineers, I don't know how many engineers and architects working on where do we put the support pieces, all the different jacks and how are we going to get this wall to come back in? It was 21 inches off base. It was just hanging out at an angle. So they got all the jacks in, and during the, that winter, Chris would go out every week and do a half a crank on those big jacks. Every jack, he would do one crank. And he's standing there one day in January looking at that wall and just kind of leaning on the thing, you know, how are we going to get this to go back in 22 inches? They're talking about great big winches and from one wall to the other and screw things and whatever. And he's leaning against the wall and it just went right back into place by about three inches off. <laughs> so they had jacked it up enough that this wall was now hanging truly free and you could just push it right in. So it's strongly engineered. And again, you can see the staving with uh, the fact work in between. 
question. Yes. Um, I'm Kathy Sixel and Janet, I want to know, I think you also made a new foundation on the north side. Oh, yes, let me tell you about the foundation. The, that north wall foundation, we took it out the entire length of the building, from east to west, not including the addition, which was an additional 20 feet, I believe. But we took it down to base, and that summer, we had master masons and helping us out, and we had horses with stone bolts out. I mean, we had a great time. But we took it down to absolutely base. What you see here, there's still an additional three, four feet underneath the ground of base. The, um, the mason people put in a concrete base with rebar. You should give this guy that did it, with, that came out with his crew, what was uh, it? Schmidt. Was Jim, it? Jim, Jim Schmidt. Schmidt. Yeah, there was an article in the paper a bunch of years ago of what a wonderful parquet floor that he put into his house. He's a master mason and a master carpenter. So he was wonderful. So he donated um, putting in the concrete base with the rebar. And then he showed us, he taught us how to mix mortar with our recipe, how to lay stones, how to split stones, how to fit them in properly so that you'd have get, you would get the, the best um, support and stone-to-stone -stone contact. Also on this wall, when we pulled this out, we found out that all the way, every about every 10 feet, there's a gigantic stone that the foundation rests on. And then, then there's all this stuff in between time. So this wall itself is about five feet deep. And that's totally redone. This whole wall now is redone. There, because of all the, the the water running through and the damage of weather and whatever. The base timbers, the bottom timbers, and part of the uprights had to be replaced. So every one of these, all the way across the north wall, has some part of it that had to be replaced. So we've had barn timbers donated to us from all sorts of places. <laughs> we still have some stacks that we had to sort through to see what we could use. I mentioned the jacks. I want to just point out what the jacks look like. Okay. We put these big timbers in, and then these are called screw jacks. And then you put a bar through it, and then you just crank on it. These, t these timbers that they use for putting in, and then there's often another timber in between them. I, re I remember seeing one time um, four big, sturdy men having to hoist one of those timbers up. Those things weigh, one of these timbers weighs about 150 to 200 pounds. Now on the south wall, we've had to replace the entire base timber. And, where's those pictures? Right here. Another uh, picture presented, and there's more information about that also. Go right ahead, please. As we were talking about all the restoration work that's being done, as much as possible, we do everything as it originally was done, with original old-fashioned tools. And actually, here's a picture of one of the old-fashioned tools. This is a drill. You sit, you put it on the timber, and then you sit astraddle the timber, and you just crank the, this machine, and it puts a drill hole in it. And you have all kinds of different drill bits to get different sizes. Then we use it. Um, and especially in starting uh, muttons and tendons. The, the tendon is the part that fits into the mutton, into the pocket. Okay. Um, Question from the floor pertaining to mixing of mortar, and uh, we'll have some answers for it. Go right ahead, please. And in, in terms of mixing mortar, we don't use mixers or anything. That stuff gets put into this big mixing pan, and people hand mix it. And of course, our master mason told us how to do that correctly. And then it's a real fine tuning of exactly how much water you have to add. And you can only make so much at a time because it'll dry out. Okay. So, you know, if we made a big batch and it's lunchtime, well, lunch can't happen until we've used up that batch. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll be just a dried lump by the next time. Right. Very good. Thank you. Now, the base timber on the south wall, they just use these humongous trees for the original construction. On the north wall, when I showed you that picture of these two pieces, two big timbers that were together between the second and third floor, that whole north wall, the bottom timber and those two timbers that we know, we don't know what the top timber looks like, there's only two timbers per 
side or per wall. It's not pieced any more than one time. So these trees had to be, you know, 30, 40 feet in order to get the, the, that length of a timber to make of a 90 foot wall. So since we had to redo the south wall base timber, which was 39 feet, Chris again tracked down some um, oak trees, red oak. Somebody near Plymouth has a maple forest and he had some oak trees in it he wanted to get rid of. So we bought eight oak trees last summer and the person took it out of his woods, he cut them down, took them out of the woods and then we hauled them to the house barn last summer. And this is, in this portrait, it's one of the timbers that's being hauled. They average from 29 to 42 feet the eight, t eight trees that we hauled out. Whoa. And one of those, um, if you buy Centerville Settlement's calendar this year, <laughs> <laughs> you will see I have one page that shows the timber like this, and then as we're shaping it, and as it's actually shaped and ready to be put into position. We did cheat a little bit on it. They did use a power saw to take off some of the bark to get it down at least into semblance of a square. But then everything else was hand hewn. You know, you take an ax and you have to make, chip it down to the exact dimensions that you want. And then all of the other little parts were all hand shaped as well. Okay. And that timber that we put into the south wall this year is 39 feet and four inches. And that was pretty much bulled in by, by people. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's where that's where the physics comes in with using pulleys and levers as well. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you. Some uh, wood that was being obtained from Plymouth area, and you mentioned the name, and I guess the, somebody from the floor said it was maybe something else. Well, I had said it was red oak, and it's in fact white oak. Okay. And then I said, do you know how to tell the difference between a white oak and a red oak when it's growing? Ah. And you can tell it by the leaves. Okay. A red oak will have pointy oak leaves, and a white oak will have round. And to remember that, if you think of Native American arrows are pointy or red oak, and bullets from white man were round. Okay. <laughs> Very good. good. Yeah, Thank you. Good. <laughs> we have uh, a long, young lady, rather, that would like to say something in regard to the Lutzi House Barn. Right ahead, please. My name is Kathy Sixel, and uh, we are tearing, going to tear the barn down on the original farm where I grew up. It was the Leckler Homestead, and it is was is located eight miles west of Kiel. So uh, Charlie and Jerry and Chris Connell came up, and Richard Wiegand, and we took a lot of the artifacts out of that barn. And one of the things they did, they had never st seen stanchions. And if I recall right, my grandfather made some of those stanchions. And they took them out in a section of 10, right? And they saved all the timbers and things. And they're going to reinstate them, in, or at least part of them, into the house barn. And I still have the um, blacksmith shop. You know, my, my dad had a blacksmith shop, and it had a forge in it. So uh, instead of throwing it away, we saved it, the cinders, the tools, everything we could. We had a truck, a uh, couple of trailer loads full okay. of things that we took out of the barn from my homestead, and I think it's a privilege to have it in the house barn. Thank well, you. we are very grateful. That you yeah, so, it. and as I saw things up there, and you remember the tin that you used to put under your stove? There was a, a square, a big square of tin oh, like that. Mm -hmm. We found one of those, oh, too. Yeah. And so I thought we may as well bring it down there and uh, reuse it. So, and the cream separator, I'm, I think I've got part over there. I think Gilbert gave us one. Oh, okay, because the other part is in the attic yet, you know, and uh, whatever I thought they could use, because once these articles are gone, they're going to be gone. You just you aren't bet. going to get them anymore. Mm -hmm. So if anybody hears of anybody that's uh, cleaning out, or old uh, clothing from years ago is real hard to find. So if anybody hears of anything, please contact us so we can save it for artifacts for when this barn is ready to go. Okay. And I must tell you another story. You know, I stayed at the sleepover 
Um, I think there was there 12 or 21? First year was 12. 12. Okay, there were 12 people, and I stayed with my granddaughter, Nicole uh, Sixel, and I stayed okay. together. And she just loves it at this house barn. It is unreal. The next year we went, we stayed again, and I got the mattress that had the hole in it. And it gets real flat, you know, and you're old and quite stiff. So I went home in the morning, and then I fell asleep. I went home to get food. And uh, she had a girlfriend along that year, Katie Croft. Those girls just absolutely loved it. I said, we'll stay till after breakfast. Well, please, can we stay? So then they stayed till dinner. Then we were leaving, and Marie Pfeiffer had made soap. And they, and they had put it in a little check cloth and wrapped it with a ribbon. And we're driving out, and I have to back up and turn around because they forgot their precious soap that was made in 1939, right? 59. Oh, 59. And otherwise, they would never, ever look at that or touch it, right? But they just love it. And we go there once a year. We just were there for the Halloween party again. Okay. And the girls just love it there. Good. And this year, we uh, it was Nicole Sixel and Emily Frice and uh, Katie Croft, and they just love it there. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I, have, um, I wanted to tell you about um, people who come out to the house barn. As I said, we've had people who've come out to the house barn to help work from all over the world. Several summers in a row, we've had a, a retired timber framer from Germany who's come out, and that was a hoot because he couldn't speak English, but we certainly knew what he was getting across. <laughs> He, he had his ways of how he wanted to do it. But we have had five-year-olds helping us lay stone. We have had all sorts of people coming out and helping and doing whatever projects they feel able to do. Lots and lots of stones with the initials on from people who've been out there laying stone. People want to know, when will it be done? We don't know. Because it's, as I said before, it's not the preservation of it building itself, but it's also the preservation of the skills. You know, if, if we had some money, if we did a big fundraiser, we could get somebody to come in and finish it up. But that's not what the organization has wanted. Went way, way, way back when we started the organization of where we're going to get money from, the, the members themselves said, we want to work on it. This is what it's all about, is preserving the skills and learning the things that went into the building and learning about the family and learning about the community that this building represents. So we don't know when it's going to be done. What's it going to look like when we're finally done? We do know that we're going to restore it to about 1880 when the, the addition had been put on. And we, as very much as possible, we want to restore it to as close to the original function as possible, that it would be a functioning building. So if somebody could live there and somebody could have animals there. And, um, there was another thought that went through my mind. <laughs> we may have a room that will be a meeting room or uh, an organizational room. And we will be putting in some safety equipment, you know, some side, you know, handrails in the stairwells. But as far as electricity and all of that, it's only for maintenance purposes. It will be as close as possible as to what it had originally been in the 1880s. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, more information here at the end, and uh, we can combine that with uh, what we already learned. Go right ahead, please. I wanted to be sure Kathy reminded me, um, way back when we started the project, Gilbert Ahrens donated his uh, log building to the organization, which we totally dismantled and labeled, so we can re-put it back together again. And one of the thoughts is that we would put it on the north side of the property and use it as an interpretive building or gift and a gift shop building or meeting building mm -hmm. for the house barn so the house barn could stay as a functioning unit. Um, cultural things that we've done to try and preserve the cultures, um, as I said, we did the bake oven. Uh, uh, one of our, our interested members, in fact, Gail Ashey, who did the posters, has a quilting group that she would like to bring and do some workshops. Uh, we've had um, people who showed us how to weave and use wools at some of our open houses. Stenciling. Stenciling, we had an exhibit on stenciling. Kathy had mentioned we've done um, some soap making at the house barn. Um, as much as possible, we come up with ideas of things that used to be and have workshops or classes in them, not, as well as working just on the house barn. You know, we have the workshops in timber framing and 
and archiving and um, nagging and stone masonry and that types of things, but we have other cultural kinds of programs as well. Yes, okay. did some spinning and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there something something coming up uh, this fall yet, or uh, Are you, the fall? We usually do one thing in fall, and the activity that we did this fall was a farming tour. It's called Farming Through the Ages, and we started the Lutzi House Barn with um, a history of farming, and farming in the 1850s. Then we go to a typical family farm, a Wisconsin farm, and this year we went to. Um, Sue Crocks Farm. So it's just a, a very typical small farm. She mm -hmm. milks less than 100 head, and that's what farms usually are in Wisconsin. If you didn't know that, we are losing 1,000 farms a, a year in Wisconsin. And from there, we go to Soaring Eagle, which is a much larger high-tech farm. And we talk about uh, government regulation, patru uh, patru um, pollution management, uh, how much phosphorus they can put on the land, high tech, how they use the GPS and computers in farming these days. Um, Soaring Eagle is actually a corporation and they have human resource people and all sorts of stuff. They offer benefits. And from there then we go to um, Saxon Homestead and talk about alternative farming methods. What other ways are there to farm besides what you've already seen? And farming in its place Wisconsin farming and U.S. farming in its place in the world and the future of farming. Then the idea is to remember about farming, promote farming in general in Wisconsin, but hopefully, especially for the city people, to help them understand where their food comes from and what a production it is to get it to their table. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Festivities that are going to be coming up shortly, and we'll have some information being provided. Go right oh, ahead. Oh, yeah. Talk about cultural events. You need to come to our Christmas party. We do an old fashioned Christmas dinner. It is always the first Monday of December, and it is meant to remember Christmases as they were. We usually work with the restaurant, and we have turkey brought to the table and carved at the table, and we, as much as possible, we have old family recipes for the dressing and different desserts um, and German that wine. oh yes we always have a German wine and my favorite part is well of course we always have some entertainment too Kathy and Chris have often entertainment and Kathy's band has often come to help entertain but my favorite part is we do some Christmas reminiscing after we're all done eating and giggling and having a great time we tune, tune the lights down just a little bit and People just share stories of what they remember about Christmas. It could be from when they were a little child or something memorable recently. We have children, who, younger people who come and share their Christmases. Um, some of the older people who've been in, in the war will tell us about um, their Christmases on the German front or in the Pacific. It's just such a warm, pleasant evening. It is such a nice kickoff for the holiday season. And it's so reasonably <laughs> you really should come. Um, the last couple of years, we've, the restaurants we've had have had so many Christmas decorations, we haven't had to worry about any ourselves, but we used to bring our own tree, and people would make old-fashioned ornaments or bring family heirloom ornaments to hang on it for, for the evening. Um, Ed Heckman brought, one year brought his collection of sleigh bells and talked about them. It's just a very, very nice evening, so you, you really should try and make it for it. Very good. Well, thank you. A date coming up, and we like to have the time and place. This year's Christmas dinner is December 6th at the Wilderness Inn in Plymouth. And I know for sure we'll have carved turkey, and we will probably have butternut squash soup, which was just fabulous last year. Okay. <laughs> and also, I mentioned the calendar before. Uh, we do a calendar that has tradition, the usual historical dates on them, you know, whose birthdays are what. But then we also have uh, some other history things of like when the Revolutionary War started or when Gutlip Lucy was born. Okay. <laughs> um, and when Centerville Settlement Meetings are, but wonderful pictures from throughout the year. Um, I put the thing together myself, so I'm always running around taking pictures of, of the community and work days, so we'll have probably
close to 100 photos okay. in the calendar this year. And again, it's a very reasonably priced calendar. Right. Is it all done already, Jenny? Not quite. I have to. I'm trying to find a picture of, of the group. Then you'd all be Oh, the yes, calendar. absolutely. Yeah. I would love to have some of you guys. About that at the, at yeah. The Halloween party. I have two, three extra pages of pictures right now that I have to hone down. I can come up with something. Very good. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you being here this evening. Thank you. We've got a young lady here who has been uh, doing a wonderful job all evening, and we've got one final thing she'd like to present. Go right ahead, please. I forgot to talk to you about how um, Centerville Settlement works as education. One of our goals is, is to, to educate the people regarding the building as well. So we have worked with a lot of groups of people. We have had Lakeland College students who worked in in public relations and marketing work with us. We have had UWM uh, School of Architecture students who have done a lot of the architectural drawings. We have started the CAD program, which is computerized architectural drawings in conjunction with Le um, Lakeshore Technical College and UW students who have done We had a, uh, an intern for a whole summer one year working on CAD drawings. We had a student from UW-Madison School of Architecture who spent a summer with us and put together a huge plan for the environmental, historic, and agricultural preservation of the area. In fact, it was a tool that was used by the township and the village in their long-term planning. Um, Manitowoc County Schools has been out a couple of summers and have done archaeological digs at our site. Uh, we've had stu stu uh, school groups who have come through at various times. The Manitowoc County German group comes through almost every year. So we work with a lot of different groups of students as part of our mission. Okay, very good. Thank you very much for I presenting. Have one more question. We've been talking about the uh, educational portion, and now we're talking about the financial portion. Right ahead, please. People often ask us where do we get the money for our Centerville Settlement. The year that we did the Northwall Foundation, that humongous project, that summer cost us $1,500 because we had so many do donations in kind. I think we just bought the lime and cement, the sand and gravel and everything else had been donated that summer. But we did do a big <coughs> fundraiser two years ago. We got a matching grant um, for 40, we wanted to raise $45,000 and the Rar West um, Foundation gave us 23 and a half if we could raise the rest and we did. So it was through a lot of private people, corporations throughout Manitowoc, Sheboygan County, and also state and national fundraising. And it was for a three-year plan, and we're into our fourth year, and we have about half of it left. <laughs> so we're very frugal in how we use our money and still get our work done. And we have lots and lots of wonderful supporters, and we get a lot of things donations in kind, um, members, even and members. And members, of course, and um, even in the township, um, the township often will do little projects with us. They needed to get rid of a couple of loads of clay and we needed infill. You know, we needed a driveway and they needed some clay, so we traded. So there's lots of ways you can get donations in kind without necessarily having bucks. And if you do go for the big money through any of the foundations, they look at what kind of community support you have, how many volunteers you have, um, what's your membership, who's on your board of directors. And I have to say our board of directors is very impressive. We have a nice variety of members from throughout the country. Um, we have great community support, especially with the donations in, in kind. So we're in a great position for going for funding if we need more funding. Mm -hmm. volunteer and volunteers. Hours. Volunteer hours. We put in, what did we put in, 1,200, 1,500 hours last summer? That's the equivalent of a full-time person almost a whole year. And it's all volunteer hours. Good. Very good. Thank you. And after uh, a full evening here, and uh, maybe we can get a little bit of a conclusion to this. Go right ahead, please. My name is Kathy Sixel, and first of all, I want to thank Janet for the wonderful presentation that she did on the uh, Centerville Settlement on a, and the history of the uh, Lutzi House Barn. Uh, we are going to be meeting January 9th at the VFW in Cleveland. 
And Mr. Matthias is going to be the presenter, and he is going to have some help with him. He has loaded, he has um, got a guest. He asked some to guests to help. And I want to thank everybody else for coming. You are a wonderful group to work with. Thank you for coming. Okay, thank you, Kathy. And uh, we'll go into a little identification thing, as everybody's aware of. Go right ahead, please. Lord Matthias. Thank you, Willard. I'm his wife, Alice. Hi, Alice. Thank you. Irene Dine. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Fred. Walter Chris. Thank you, Walter. Kathy Wagner. Thank you, Kathy, for coming. Welcome. Dolores Chris. Thank you, Dolores. Marie Pippert. Marie, thank you. Charlie Bauer. Charlie Bauer, thank you, Charlie. Dorothy Anderson. Thank you, Dorothy. <laughs> I mean, let's see. Why do I say explicit? Answer with. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're just for helping out too. I appreciate it. And would we have here, please? This is Janet Lipsy. Thank you very much for the presentation this evening. Wonderfully done. Wonderfully done. And I'm Jerry O'Neill, the videographer. Thank you for.